and welcome. My name is Kelly Weiss. I'm the Executive Director of Marketing and Communications, and thank you for joining us for the continuation of our Racial Justice Speaker Series. I wanted to go through a few quick housekeeping things. Uh, so throughout the presentation, we will have all video and audio um, muted so that we can hear our speaker. And then once we get through his comments, we will take questions through the chat and you can send those directly to me and then I will ask the questions. Uh, we will be recording this and send out um, MCLE credits as well if you selected that when you registered for the event. And now I'm going to hand it over to Dean Johnson. All right. Thank you, thank you, Kelly. Um, and thank you all for joining us for the first Racial Justice Speaker Series event of, of the academic year. Uh, we're incredibly fortunate today to have Wajahat Ali, class of 2007, right, right from here at King Hall, uh, who will speak to us virtually today uh, about his book, Back to Where You Came From, and other helpful recommendations on becoming American. Wajah will address the King Hall community in an honest and always, always, always entertaining conversation on how to build what he calls a multicultural coalition to combat the rise of hate and bigotry in the United States. He'll share some stories or offer some lessons in hope. And in, in his words, he will offer some, quote, awkward tales from law school. I'm not precisely sure what that is, but I look forward to hearing about it. In any event, Wajali promises not to bore you. Now, our Racial Justice Speaker Series is now in its third year. It, it began in a hope, in hopes of helping us better process and understand the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others, and to address more generally systemic racism in the U.S. criminal justice system. We also striven to, to show how racism affects all areas of law and society, and many different groups. Nawaj Ali is a Daily Beast columnist, a public speaker, and as he puts it, he's a recovering attorney. He's also the, the, the tired dad of three cute kids. He believes very much in sharing stories that are by us, for everyone, universal narratives told through a culturally specific lens to entertain, educate, and bridge the global divides. Born in the Bay Area to Pakistani immigrant parents, Waj went to school wearing, this is according to him, husky pants and knowing only three words of English. He didn't tell me what those words were. He graduated from UC Berkeley with an English major and became a licensed attorney. He says that he knows what it feels like to be the token minority in the classroom and the dark darkest person in a boardroom. Watch his essays, interviews, and reporting have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and many other news outlets. Watch has spoken to many organizations, from Google, to Walmart Jet, to Princeton, to the United Nations, to the Chandi Indian Pakistani restaurant in Newark, California, as well as in his living room before his three kids. Please welcome Waj Ali. Thank you, Dean Johnson, for that amazing introduction that makes me sound much more awesome than I actually am. If I was there, I would actually uh, give you money, but I'm not, so I'll Venmo you. Uh, good afternoon, all, and Ramar Tova to our Jewish brothers and sisters fasting today for the holy day of Yom Kippur and who could not attend what will be an amazing one-hour event where all of you shall get MCLE credit. Um, as a former graduate, pro proud former graduate of UC Davis King Hall, I had actually always dreamt uh, of returning one day to my alma mater to give a keynote speech as a giant face on a Zoom screen. And even though I am but a lowly, humble, independent, self-employed writer and a recovering attorney who hasn't practiced law in about 12 years, and was rejected by every single corporate law firm upon graduation, here I am as your auspicious august speaker for your excellent annual racial justice series, invited to talk about the power of writing your own story, investing in hope in hopeless times, and joining, as Dean Johnson said, what I call the Multicultural Coalition of America, also known as the Multicultural Avengers, to hopefully, inshallah, uplift 
all of our communities in this ongoing experiment of a country known as America. All of this is to say is that karma is real, karma is brown, karma is wearing a very expensive sports jacket, and karma today is very petty. Uh, the truth is, actually, Dean Johnson first went to uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. She said no. Then they went to Neil Katyal. He said no. And then they went to Freed Zakaria. And after all of the other Browns said no, uh, I said yes for free. So this is what you get. But like I said, be grateful. Free MCLE credit. So, you know, watch something on Netflix while you have my, my face and voice in the background. Uh, a little bit about me, for those who don't know. I was born and raised in America. And yet every single day on every single platform... I still get very helpful, unsolicited messages telling me to go back to where I came from, to which I respond, the Bay Area, California, specifically Fremont. I would love to if you could subsidize my rent. Now, usually the people who give me this unsolicited advice are very angry. So they respond again, this time in all caps, and they usually say, go F a goat or a camel, to which I always say, why only goats and camels? There's an entire diverse animal kingdom. Two legs good, four legs good. Why the obsession with goats and camels? But then I say, listen, I've been married to the same woman for over 11 years. I'm a middle-aged man. I no longer have the physical dexterity or time to engage in bold sexual experimentation. Why don't you go F a goat or a gap camel and report back to me? To which then they get very pissed off and they respond in their third email with all caps and bad spelling. And usually they forget that Y-O-U-R is not the same as Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. All of this is to say that it is very exciting to be an outspoken professional Muslim man of brown skin in the United States of America in the year 2023, or according to my many critics, and yes, folks, believe it or not, I have critics. I am, and I'm going to quote them, a, quote, professional race hustler sucking at the teat of liberal guilt, uh, who is actually the real racist because I talk about racism and inequalities and double standards in America. And for those of you who are curious, white liberal guilt is delicious. Salty, yet delicious. And by the way, it's going to be like this for the next 35 minutes. So if you're having a good time, you're going to have a great time. And if you're not, buckle up and you're going to get some MCLE credits. Uh, like Dean Johnson said, for the next 30, 35 minutes, 40 minutes, I have no desire to talk down to you, lecture to you, tell you the usual post-George uh, Floyd protest spiel about DEI because you all have heard it before. Uh, most of you will roll your eyes. Uh, some of you will zone out. Other people will swipe right on Tinder. Good luck. Uh, you'll nod your head and laugh at the right parts because you're afraid of getting canceled. And the whole time you'll be updating your Netflix queue. But we're in a moment right now, so I have been told. And in this heightened moment, and black people will say this moment has lasted for over 400 years, in this moment in America, if you even mention the words diversity in some academic places or in some corporate law firms, it can get you fired. Uh, in this moment in America, some parents are more comfortable with their kids potentially getting COVID at school or shot than reading a book by a black woman. Uh, we're banning books in the year 2023. A record number of books have been banned in the past year, more than 3,000. And in some states that won't be named, uh, but might rhyme with Florida, uh, you apparently can't say gay uh, because saying gay uh, makes some people uncomfortable. So don't say gay. And apparently uh, it's like Beetlejuice. If you say gay three times, magically gay people appear. If there's any gays, welcome. And and for those of you who aren't gay, I'm pretty sure me saying gay three times didn't make you gay. And if it did, welcome. But the world has not ended. I just said gay and gay people exist and transgender kids uh, are still marginalized and being bullied and harassed around the world. And yet there are anti-transgender legislation all around America. Apparently feminism is making men weak, even though women don't have equal pay. And women just lost a constitutionally protected right in America. Asian people are, are apparently crushing it. We're the model minority, the only model that is celebrated for being invisible. And yet Asian Americans are being bullied and beaten up because of COVID, a pandemic that has no ethnicity or nationality. And the world's richest troll is openly tweeting, or as he would prefer, zeding anti-Semitic conspiracies without any pushback. And black people are still being targeted for surviving while black in this country. All of this is to say, in the United States of America, 
we engage often in these, uh, what I call fantastic Cirque du Soleil gymnastics and oftentimes undemocratic measures just to avoid talking about our respective countries' amazing, awesome, and ridiculous history of racism, double standards, and inequities. And oftentimes when you're in a corporate setting, everyone wants to get to reconciliation. How do we get to reconciliation? But I have a question for all of us. How do you get to reconciliation without truth? You can't, you don't, you won't. The same people who are trying to ban our books need to maintain certain fictional stories and myths about America because these stories are comfortable and convenient and they help their tribe stay in power and feel good, even if that feeling that temporary feeling comes at the expense of truth, equality, fairness, accountability, and justice. Apparently, telling the real story of America is not worth the immense economic anxiety. But with the 29 minutes I have left, I want to make the case, because I'm still a recovering attorney, and I, I want to see if I still have some pre-trial pre and trial practice skills left, that the short-term anxiety and discomfort of reading dangerous books and listening to uncomfortable stories and having tough conversations is worth it. And investing in hope in what seems like utterly hopeless times is worth it. And joining the ethnic Avengers, or if you read DC Comics, the Justice League, is worth it. I believe in the long run, this is the ne necessary medicine, the antidote, if you will, that is needed to heal our communities and perhaps even save our lives. I know because it saved my life and it saved my daughter's life. And it might save someone's life right now who is listening to my giant brown face on this Zoom seminar. I believe that the only way forward in this country called America is to stretch and expand ourselves, our workplaces, our communities, our law schools, so that everybody has a chance to succeed and potentially be a co-protagonist of the evolving American narrative. And if there's only one wise thing I say today, and literally there might be only one wise thing, just because, just seriously, think of, just, just wait. This might be the only one wise thing. It's this. In America, if you aren't telling your story, your story is always being told to you by others. And if you aren't writing your story, your story will always be written for you by others. So as Dean Johnson said, as we talk for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I do not want to bore you because I sincerely believe boring an audience is a sin. I think it's an all religious text. I think it was even in the Bible that Donald Trump held up. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, Corinthians chapter seven, verily thou shalt boreth an audience. So hopefully I shall not bore you and give you the usual spiel with data and Excel sheets. Instead, I'm going to use a lot of archaic but exquisite 80s and 90s pop cultural references. And for the Gen Z that don't know, just Google it. We're going to take a DeLorean back to the time of Empire Strikes Back 1980 when I was born in Fremontistan, California to two Pakistani Muslim immigrant parents. My father came to America as a young Fabi kid in the year 1966. He was 18 years old. He came here with his older brother, Sultan, who was 19. Thanks to the 1965 Immigration Nationality Act, which removed the historically racist quotas that were put in place to keep away the invaders at that time, which were Asians, Eastern European Jews, and Catholics and Italians. Thanks to the 1965 INA, which was passed on the heels of the civil rights movement, voila, people like my dad, who were students in Karachi, could come to America, the Willy Wonka golden ticket. 1965 INA passes. My dad comes with his brother. He lands in California with his shalvar kameez and kurta, and he sees all these hippies with long hair, and he sees the civil rights movement and free love. He's like, what the hell is happening? And next thing you know, my dad ditches the kurta and shalvar kameez for long hair and bell bottoms. And if any of you are a certain age and if you have seen your parents actually be cool in photographs, it is a very, very traumatic experience because I thought my father was born wearing glasses, bald, and in khakis. But apparently, for a brief moment, he was cool. So he's a nerdy kid, super smart. Stays in uh, California, eventually goes to graduate school, gets a scholarship to Northern Illinois University, uh, gets a fellowship, TA. Uh, and he said back in those days, to get an extension, it was very easy. You used to go fill out your paperwork, and you'd get a stamp of approval to get an extension of your visa. My dad says that he goes to do the usual routine, and there's a white man, an immigration officer, who looks up and down at him. 
with disgust. And my father's spidey sense at the time said, oh, something bad's going to happen. And this guy mumbling to himself says, you Arabs only come to America to fuck our American girls. Ugh. And he orders him deported. Now, if you've been paying attention to my story, we are not Arabs. We are Pakistani Americans. And to my knowledge, my father was not effing any American girls. And if he was, last time I checked, and again, I'm a recovering attorney, it was not illegal. But now my dad has a one-way ticket back to Karachi. He has one, one week to leave. He's frustrated. He's, he's exhausted. He's not a lawyer. He's poor. He goes to every attorney in Chicago. They say, I'm so sorry this is happening to you. You're SOL. The last day, Friday, day before he is about to go to Karachi on the one-way ticket, he says he goes to a final law firm. And the head of the law firm says, I'm so sorry, I can't help you. But he says there was a young white man, like a recent college grad, a law school grad, 24 or 25, who got hired by the law firm. And he was just waiting for his bar results. My father leaves dejected. He's in the parking lot. This kid, young man, follows him out. He says, listen, I heard your story. Uh, don't get on that plane. I, I think there's something we could do for you. There's a new special type of visa given to uh, immigrants with extraordinary abilities. I'll do the paperwork pro bono. Don't get on the plane. I'll go with you to the immigration judge next week. So that my dad says, okay, I got nothing, nothing to lose. Doesn't get on the plane. This man keeps his word, joins him. The judge, who my father says based on his last name, he could tell was a Jewish American. The judge reviews this, realizes this isn't kosher, shocks, uh, shakes his head, apologizes to my dad. Because if you could get me the paperwork for this special visa, I'll process it. Fast forward a few months, my father was about to be deported gets the special visa, which later becomes uh, becomes the Einstein visa or the E-visa, uh, the same visa that allowed Melania Trump to become a citizen. My father was a brilliant uh, young student and scholar and a researcher. Melania Trump uh, posed naked uh, on a, a, a fur rug for the cover of GQ. Regardless, both of them become citizens, thanks to, specifically for my father, the kindness of a young lawyer. And I mentioned that story because it's a beautiful microcosm of America. The openness of America, the kindness of one man allows my father to stay, and the bigotry of another almost eradicated this narrative and the story that I'm about to tell you. Fast forward, my dad goes to Karachi, Pakistan years later because he's 30 years old, which is like dead zone in South Asian culture to get married. And his mother's like, you better get married immediately. Sees my mom. They talk for five minutes. Love marriage. They get married 11 days later, as one does. My mom now goes to America. She's an American citizen. They moved to California. And I'm born in the year 1980 in Fremont, California. And my parents, in order to make me blend, decide to name me Wajahat. Awesome. And people always ask, Wajahat is a common name in Pakistan. It is not, people. So my parents decided to name me Wajahat. And I was also very special because my parents thought, we won't teach him English. Because who needs English in the United States of America? So I couldn't speak English until I was five years old. I learned English in ESL, English as a second language, and to answer uh, Dean Johnson's curiosity, the three phrases of English that I knew when my parents dropped me off at Child's Hideaway Preschool, the name of the preschool was Child's Hideaway, it foreshadowed bad things, was the following. Shut up, because my mother used to say shut up to me. Idiot, because idiot used to follow shut up. And uh oh pasgetio, which was my way of saying uh oh spaghetti, which was a camel soup commercial in the 80s. So shut up, idiot, uh oh pasgetio. Only three phrases of English that I knew when I was dropped off at Child's Hideaway at the age of five. I was named Wajahat, not common, the only brown guy, the only Muslim guy. I was also left-handed, which anyone who's of Asian persuasion knows. The left hand in our communities is only used to do one thing, and that one thing is to wash your bum. So what they try to do is convert you from left-handed to right hand. You're going to learn a lot, by the way, folks. I'm going to share all of our secrets. So I didn't take. They tried to hold my left hand behind my back and threw tennis balls at me, as one does to convert me to right-handed. But I it did not work. So to this day, I'm the only left-handed person in both sides of my family. Left-handed, only South Asian, only Muslim. I was also very, as they said in the 80s, healthy, uh, which is a nice way that Asian aunties say big boned. Uh, they look at you and say, oh, mashallah, he has a very big appetite. I, I was fat. And I was fat in the decade where there was no uh, Dove soap commercials about body positivity, no anti-bullying messages, no Lizzo. In the 80s, I'm going to traumatize some people. There are going to be some tears. I'm sorry. But in the 80s, there were two types of kids, the normies and the quote-unquote fat kid. And every day, if you were a quote-unquote fat kid, was World War III. It was brutal, all right? It was so brutal that the only pants that we could wear were something called husky pants. And if you know the, the joy and trauma of husky pants, you know that they were available at Sears, and you had to walk past 
this gauntlet of the normie kids section and in the specific back end of Sears, a pant for us healthy kids called Husky, where on the back side of your butt, written in Times New Roman 96 font that you could see from space, it said Husky. All this is to say that I was crushing it as a kid. Uh, uh, I was really winning. Uh, yet I ended up graduating with an English major from UC Berkeley. I graduated from UC Davis uh, as an attorney. I married a high school varsity cheerleader who's a brilliant woman and a doctor who won most attractive in elementary school. And all of this is to say is hashtag it gets better and I love America. To quote the opening lines of The Godfather, I believe in America. And yet it's school where most of us who are the other, most of us who are something called BIPOC, if you don't know what BIPOC is, it means black indigenous person of color. Interesting, I learned this phrase three years ago. I'm apparently the POC of BIPOC. Uh, some people use it. Uh, for me, it sounds like uh, an advanced sleep apnea machine or a robot sent from the future to kill us. But apparently for us BIPOCs, uh, for anyone who is an immigrant, for anyone who is an other, school in America is where you learn your place in the American hierarchy. And as Dean Johnson said, I've been very lucky, traveled all around America and the world. I usually ask people, I said, when was the first time, oh, fellow BIPOCs, when you got hit with your first racist uh, sentiment? And 95% of the people in the audience always say this, five. Some people say four. Some people say six. Five. School. School is when you usually find out, oh, I'm the other. School, and specifically the age of five, was where someone came to me and said, why is your skin color the color of poo? And I'm like, I don't speak English. Uh, but that's where I learned that I'm not the protagonist of the American narrative. People who look like me, people who have my skin color, people who have my ethnicity, people who have a different religion, people who have ovaries, we are oftentimes not the protagonist, but we are at best the sidekicks, or worse, we're villains, or we're excised from the story altogether. And the question I always have, is it better to be a villain or is it better to be invisible? Because at least when you're a villain, you have a speaking part. Anyone who plays the Joker gets an Academy Award nomination. But when you're invisible, it's like you don't exist. And what happens to you when you're in school and you don't see yourself as the hero of the story? When you watch the Hollywood movies and your people are being killed by Chuck Norris and you're rooting for Chuck Norris, what happens when you see the billboards and no one with your skin is seen as beautiful. What happens is some of us learn to hate ourselves. You learn to hate the color of your skin. You wish you were white. You wish you were light skin. Oh, you wish you had blue eyes. You wish you had a flatter nose. Oh, you wish you had bigger eyes. You wish your hair was a bit different. And for some of us, it stays with us, that self-loathing. For me, thankfully, I was very lucky. I had a lot of love, came from a very loving brown South Asian family, but even me, it seeped through this thing called white supremacy. It seeped through. And I remember I was six years old. I could speak a little bit of English now because I have ESL. And I go home and I tell my mother and I say, mother, I want an American name. And my mother operates in two modes that immigrant modes operate on, blunt or very blunt. And she said, what the hell are you talking about? And I said, I'll let you keep the W of Wajad, but I want an American name. And I gave her choices. Now you would imagine I would probably give her some oaky American names like William or Walter or Wilt. I chose Wilbur. Wilbur. And the reason I chose Wilbur was because we were reading Charlotte's Web and the pig was named Wilbur and everyone loved the pig. So I thought maybe they'll like me. That's why I chose Wilbur. And my mom looked at me with the quickness of a blunt immigrant mother and said, your name is Wajahat. Never talk to me about this again. And here we are in the United States of America in the year 2023, and a third of Americans, folks, believe in some aspect of the replacement theory. And for those of you who don't know, the replacement theory is a conspiracy theory that has come from the swamps of white supremacists, KKK, and Nazis, both in Europe and America, which posits that the Jews, and you always have to say the Jews, are part of an international cabal. Specifically, they're the nerve center. They're the brains that are using immigrants, Muslims, and feminists, and the LGBTQ community to weaken and replace Western civilization, which is a code word, code word for white people. A third of Americans believe in some aspect of the replacement theory in the year 2023, thanks to some politicians, some people who are going to run for president again, who have mainstreamed it. And whenever I hear this, first you cry, but then you also have to laugh because I say, if they only knew that we never wanted to replace them, we just wanted an invite to the party. 
right? Or to be left alone. You know, when I was growing up, I never wanted to replace Chip and Chet. I wanted Chip and Chet to invite me to his house to eat this mysterious dish called meatloaf, which to this day fascinates me. I've only had it once. It fascinated me as a kid. Apparently, white people ate meatloaf. And I'm like, mother, can you make meatloaf? And she's like, we're desi. We will eat biryani. We will never have meatloaf in this house. And all of us, like ethnic kids and BIPOCs heard like, that like white people can wear shoes in their home and apparently their parents don't murder them. And like, we were just amazed, like Evan can wear shoes in his house. We need to see. And like, we heard rumors that they could talk back to their parents and their parents wouldn't murder them. We're like, what? So we just wanted an invite. None of us wanted to replace you. And yet here we are where a third of Americans think that we want to replace you. And the replacement theory in particular has radicalized terrorists, both here and abroad to commit violence against Jews in Pittsburgh, against Latinos in El Paso against Muslims in Christchurch, against black people in Charleston, um, and against uh, others, specifically even allies. Uh, just two weeks ago, there was a white mother in LA who was killed by a man who in part was radicalized by these conspiracy theories because she had a pride flag outside of her store in support and allyship of the LGBTQ community. She refused to take down the pride flag and she was shot and killed. Hate affects all of us, bigots, aren't nuanced. And so as I was growing up, I was oftentimes the token. And maybe some of you who are fellow BIPOCs or the immigrant or the LGBTQ kid, you know, when you're the token, specifically the token brown kid, uh, no one else looks like you, at, like you at school. And as such, at an early age, you become the cultural ambassador of all your people. So from the age of like six to college, uh, I had to represent 1.7 billion people in 1400 years of Islamic civilization on the drop of a dime. I had to be an expert on Islam, Quran, the Prophet Muhammad, Sharia, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Bollywood, Hamas, Hamas, and everything in between. I remember um, it was uh, fifth grade during the first Iraq war. Uh, my teacher was like, Wajad, why don't you get up and talk about the Iraq war? I'm like, I'm Pakistani. They're like, it's okay. Get up and talk. And the next year, sixth grade, they're like, Wajad, why do Muslim women wear a hijab? I'm like, I'm a boy. They're like, it's fine. Get up and talk. And so I became the conduit, the one dude who was the representative of all my peoples. But I enjoyed always being that guy who shared our stories. But I was shy. I was overweight. I was anxious. I had terrible allergies. I used to sweat profusely when talking to girls, right? Uh, I used to hide myself in the corner. I never used to want to take up space. I used to apologize for apologizing. I was the type of kid, if I sneezed uh, alone in a room, I would say sorry. Then I'd look up and like, why did I just say sorry? I was that kid. And sometimes all it takes is one person, one mentor, one teacher, one professor, one colleague, that believes in you. For me, it was fifth grade. In fifth grade, there was Mrs. Peterson from Kentucky. And she was like the Southern Mary Poppins. She came in for one year and flew away. And she made us do 20 creative projects. And one creative project, she made us write a short story. It was supposed to be a one-page short story. I ended up writing a 10-page short story. And in this particular story, I did my rendition of Robin Hood because there was a movie starring Kevin Costner of Yellowstone, uh, who was Robin Hood with an American accent. And we saw the movie and Morgan Freeman, whom the kids know as the voice of God. In that movie, he was this uh, Muslim character named Azim. And in this movie, he was like a badass. And so for all of us brown kids, you have to realize there was no Kamala Harris. There was no uh, Aziz Ansari. There was no Hasan Minhaj. There was no Miss Marvel. There was no uh, uh, you know, Riz Ahmed. All we had was Apu. Apu is a 2D cartoon voiced by a white guy. That's all we had. When you are starving for representation, you will take a 2D cartoon voiced by a white guy portraying a Hindu Indian. So that's all we had. So we saw Azim, and Azim was like this badass Muslim character played by Morgan Freeman. In the movie, if you've ever seen it, there's a scene where he prays, and we're watching that movie in the theater. And we're like, yo, what is he doing? And we're like, I think he's praying. And we're like, no Muslim prays like that. We're like, you know what? It's okay. He's a badass. We'll take it. The bar was low. So I imagined myself watching that movie as a brown Robin Hood, what happens if I was a hero and I got made Marion? So I wrote a 10 page short story. And for the first time in my life, I got an A plus 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 plus. And Miss Peterson said, get up in front of the class, watch and tell this story. It's fantastic. And I'm like, Miss Peterson, I'm shy. I'm fat. Please don't make me. She goes, quiet, fatty. Get up and recite the story. So in front of my homeroom for the first time in my life, much like right now, with my voice trembling, my hands shaking, I read the story and I expected my homeroom to make fun of me because that's what they did because I was the fat kid. And instead, I had them. I had their attention. The girls who I liked were leaning in. Their eyes were wide. They laughed at the right parts and it was intoxicating. And they gave me an applause at the end. 
Two weeks later, Ms. Peterson said there was a, a, a sixth grade, seventh grade uh, upperclassman talent show. I'm gonna have to recite that story then. I'm like, Ms. Peterson, don't make me. She goes, quiet, fatty, do it again. And so I did it again in front of the upperclassmen. It was the same response. And I remember feeling at that time that I had unlocked a superhero power. Once in a while, I could perhaps spin a yarn and grab people's attention. And it was awesome. I ran home, I gave my father the story, my father reads the story in the kitchen, drinking chai. And he says, beta, which means son, you should think about becoming a writer because you have talent. And my mother rushes from the kitchen and says, but first become a doctor. True story. Because if you are a child of immigrants, you know that there is a checklist of American success. And in that checklist, uh, there are four occupations. The occupations are as following doctor, engineer, corporate lawyer, very important, corporate lawyer, not like solo attorney, corporate lawyer. And dubious businessman or businesswoman who makes a lot of money and gets a two-story home and gets a nice car or when you have a family and 2.3 kids, you get a Honda Odyssey minivan or a Toyota Senna and your kids grow up and they go to a good school and they graduate with a good degree and they get a good job and you smile with your white teeth smiling and even if you're miserable, you, you smile and everyone smiles and everyone's happy and then you die. So it's that. And then finally, failure. So doctor, engineer, corporate lawyer, dubious businessman who makes a lot of money, failure. And right there and then I had a toe in failure. I go to all boys Jesuit Catholic school. Yes, I'm Muslim. And I went to all boys Jesuit Catholic high school. Slowly but surely, I'm running for the newspaper. I'm doing improv comedy. I have like eight toes down in failure. I go to UC Berkeley, undeclared till my fourth year, uh, eventually become an English major, right? But at that time, again, there was no Hassan Minaj. There was no Miss Marvel. There was no Kamala Harris. I'm like, what do I do? Uh, I guess I might as well just become an attorney. And uh, this is one of you call the every generation uh, has this baptism by fire, the the sliding door moment. Uh, I was 21 at this time undeclared. Uh, I had joined the Muslim Student Association. Now, there's some dark humor here, folks. Some people still believe the conspiracy theory that Muslims, all Muslims, knew that 9-11 was going to happen. And I always say, if I knew that 9-11 was going to happen, I would have never joined the Muslim Student Association. I would have joined the Indian Student Association, learn how to spell uh, Bhangra, go on some hot dates. But F my life, as the kids say, I joined the Muslim Student Association because the first time in my life, there were other Muslims. So by my final year, I joined the board. Like, you know, I was like vice president, 21 years old. And I see the two towers falling. And then in the scroll, it said Osama bin Laden might be responsible. And right there and then I saw a flash. I saw the next 10 years of America. And I knew we were going to get hazed. Uh, that train's never late. And as a student of American history, I knew that the magnifying glass was going to be on us. And overnight, we were no longer the moral minority. We were no longer the good minority. We were no longer asymptotic to whiteness. We, the ones with the good degrees, the model minorities, the good immigrants, were us and them, citizen and suspect, native and foreigner. We had to apologize for violent actions done by violent people we had never meant. And we had to prove our moderation for the last 20 years. And no matter what we did or do, our loyalty and patriotism is still held as suspect, even though we were born and raised here. And this country belongs to us just as it does to any real American. Uh, this is what happens, folks, when your story is flattened. Bigots aren't nuanced. The first hate crime after 9-11 wasn't against the Muslim. People forget it was in Mesa, Arizona. A white supremacist shot and killed a Sikh Indian gas station owner, Balbir Singh, who wore a turban and had a beard, had brown skin, because the white supremacists wanted revenge for those 19 foreign hijackers who brought the two towers down. Bigots aren't nuanced. Your privilege, your wealth, your credit, your moral minority status won't protect you. And F my life, my roommate had put my email on the Cal MSA website. So about 22 years ago, almost two weeks to the day, I got my first email telling me to go back to where I came from. The second email blamed me, Wajahat Ali, a son of Pakistani Muslim immigrants born and raised in America, for bringing the two towers down. But what I also learned is that we weren't alone. This story was a remake. It's a reboot. In the past, the villains were people of Japanese descent during World War II. Uh, in the 1920s and the 19th century was Catholics, Irish Catholics in particular. There were signs in America that said, no black people, no women, no dogs, no Irish. And in that day, uh, at Sproul Hall,
the first person that came up to us was a, a leader from the Japanese American community in San Francisco. And this is what they told me. We've gone through this before. It's going to be tough, but we can give you lessons and help you. The second person who came up and talked to us was a white woman who said that she had, she's Irish Catholic and her church could step up and help. She says, we're white now, but we went through this in the 19th century. If our privilege can help you, let us know. And I realized way back then, you always need a multicultural coalition of the willing. You need allies. No community can thrive in this country by itself. At the same time, I remember that I was in the short story writing class of Ishmael Reed. Ishmael Reed is a MacArthur Genius winner. He's a black man, uh, 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 just a, a treasure of America, uh, American literature. And he said, as a black man, we've been going through this for 400 years. Art and culture is how we fought back. You need to write your story. So he said, I'm watching the news right now, and your people are going to get hazed. I want you to write a play. Uh, and, and don't write a short story. You ever read, you ever, you ever read Raising the Sun, Fences, A Long Day's Journey in the Night? I'm like, yeah, traditional kitchen dramas. I'm like, yeah, write me something like that. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you have two months or you'll uh, fail. All right, bye. And so that, be that began the, the process of writing my first play, The Domestic Crusaders, A Day in the Life of a Pakistani Muslim American Family as a response to being invisible, as a response to being hazed, as a response to being the sidekick. Uh, and being the villain. And like I said before, sometimes in life, all you need is one person, one teacher, one professor, one colleague to believe in you and say, hey, you got something. I go to UC Davis Law School where I, I barely get in. And in my first year, instead of doing uh, on-campus interviews like I should have, like an idiot, I decide to, to put on the play. And so I put on the play at Berkeley Reb, DIY, did it myself, and then I put it at San Jose uh, University Theater. Uh, we we made our money back. Uh, we uh, we got BBC recording. We got San Jose Mercury News, SF Chronicle. And at that time, every single theater told me, uh, your ethnic story will not translate to the mainstream. Translation. White people don't want to see brownies talk. Uh, this won't translate. And I said, I think it will. And they're like, no, you're wrong. And so I keep at it. Uh, I graduate law school uh, in 2008 where there's uh, an economic recession. Awesome. And so in 2007, 2008, I am ended, I'm 27 years old. I end up back at home, broke ass broke, couldn't get a job to save my life. All my other peers, some of them who I see their name, all have jobs. My professors are like, what's going on with you, man? I'm like, I'm trying. I can't get a job. I'm going stir crazy. And sometimes failure in life is the best way to push us forward because going stir crazy, applying for jobs, I couldn't get anything. I start writing again and I start writing. I start writing. And within six months, they start calling me a social media journalist. And I'm like, I am. They're like, you are. I'm like, I am. And at that time, the play that I thought would take off after law school didn't take off, but uh, white liberals decide to elect my Muslim brother, Barack Hussein Obama as president. I'm like, well, white people actually vote for this guy. This is amazing. And so I thought maybe the play that I wrote, and I tried to launch during law school. Maybe now's the time to bring out the play. And so in 2009, 9-11, uh, with the eighth anniversary of 9-11, using a little bit of money that I had, I put on the play at the New Yorkian Poets Cafe for five weeks. Everyone thinks the play would fail. But the play succeeds, breaks box office records. And by the age of 30, I, I published the play. And then two years ago, the play gets republished with a 20th anniversary new edition with the forward written by my friend, Hasan Minaj, uh, karma is real, karma is brown, and karma is petty. All of this is to say, with the remaining time that I have left, is I understand uh, that you might sit, sit there and go, that's awesome, Maj, I appreciate that. I'm glad that you got to write a play and you're sitting here talking to us and, and you write for the New York Times. Who am I? I'm nobody. Uh, I'm just a corporate drone. Uh, what can I do? And we're living in a moment where there are immense challenges. I never like to bullshit an audience, right? The challenges that we have are compounded tenfold for the young bucks. Um, climate change, rising income inequality. Women just lost a constitutionally protected right. A once in a lifetime pandemic that scarred an entire young generation. Uh, rising fascism. And many people are asking, you're talking about emerging. How will we emerge? Hell, I don't even know if we will emerge. And I want to say that without realizing it, this is nothing new. This is nothing new. This has happened before. There are numerous challenges. And I understand that people are overwhelmed and exhausted. 
Uh, and it's easy to tap out. It's easy to be stuck inside our culturally isolated cocoons. It's easy to be stuck in our Facebook algorithm bubble. It's easy to say, you know what? I'm going to get my own, man. I'm going to get paid. I'm going to get laid. I'm going to go to a corporate law firm. I'm going to pay my taxes and effort. I'm going to just write out in the next 30 and 40 years. I'm going to outsource all the problems to everyone else. And cynicism and apathy, although common, although comforting, although common, are also cheap and lazy. They require zero work and zero investment. It means that you have chosen to be a spectator in life. It means you're content throwing out booze from the cheap seats. And I realize choosing to be a participant and choosing to have hope means exposing yourself to pain, to discomfort, to disappointment. And as a person of color, a BIPOC, this country will break your heart every day. But choosing to have hope and choosing to participate means you're in the ring, at least trying to push the ball forward. And I know many of you are saying, watch, well, I get it, but I'm nobody. I love nobodies. Some of my favorite people are nobodies. In fact, I am a nobody. However, I truly believe everybody has some superpower. I can once in a while tell stories. And I believe that even kindness and empathy is a superpower. People say, I'm just a stay-at-home dad or mom. I'm like, wonderful. With your actions, your rhetoric, the way you conduct yourself in the world, you are literally shaping and influencing your children. You can change generations. You can change generations. So if you're willing to come along for the ride for the next two minutes, I want to share a great saying uh, from the Prophet Muhammad that Jews also have a, a, a similar saying that even if you see the day of judgment coming around the corner, plant a seed. I'll repeat that. Even if you see a day, the day of judgment coming around the corner, plant a seed. And I know in these DEI type talks, that everyone's like, give me a checklist, man. I, I need something to do, man. Uh, without a checklist, there's nothing I could do. My thing is simple. My invitation to you, and this is all there is, is an invitation, is to choose the following. Choose to invest in hope. And if you choose to invest in hope, then I ask you to, I recommend and invite you to do the following. Choose to be aware, choose to be intentional, and choose to act. I'll repeat that. Choose to be aware, choose to be intentional, and choose to act. The opposite of awareness is ignorance. The opposite of intentionality is heedlessness. And the opposite of action is inaction. Be aware of what's happening in your home, your local community, your college campus, your workplace. Make the intention to contribute a small positive footprint in your local community and then act. Do something that can resonate and create a powerful ripple effect. And all of us who I'm talking to, I believe, I hope you don't mind, I don't mean to talk down to you, but we are privileged folks compared to most people. I've been very lucky to travel around the world. For most people around the world, folks, surviving is a victory. Every day is a struggle. And to quote, uh, Spider-Man, who quotes Uncle Ben, who quotes Voltaire, with great power comes great responsibility. And so if you choose to invest in some small way with the little privilege that you have, I hope, I hope you can choose to expand and stretch yourselves to accommodate those uncomfortable stories, that you can choose to expand your workplace to accommodate that person who might be in the corner quiet, that you could choose to do something to uplift that person who doesn't have a chance to write their story. And I'll end on this because I was just reminded this an hour ago. I'm not bullshitting you. Like an hour ago, uh, my kids are uh, at home today because of Yom Kippur, the public schools give everyone a day off. So my wife took my three kids uh, to get their checkups and uh, she just opened the door and she's and my daughter came in. I have three kids, Ibrahim, Nuseba, and Khadija because if I had to suffer with a trisyllabic name, damn it, and my daughter, Nuseba, who's in seven now, my wife said, do you know what today is? And I said, well, what's today? She goes, it's the fourth anniversary. I'm like, of what? Of her successful liver transplant. Four years ago, right before uh, the pandemic, before my daughter was about to turn three, uh, she got hit with something called hepatoblastoma, a very rare cancer. Uh, we didn't know if she'd live. She had to get a full liver transplant. Uh, and out of nowhere, uh, you know, this hit us. And I'm a dad. If anyone here is a parent, you know, especially if you're dad, our job is to fix things. How do you fix cancer? And so I tried my best. And I remember at that time, I said, I'll be damned if I make my daughter into a statistic or if she'll be invisible. The only superpower I have is I could tell her story. So I'll share her story. Maybe, inshallah, there'll be awareness. Maybe someone will step up and be a liver donor. But if my daughter doesn't survive, maybe, just maybe, instead of being a statistic, other people can step up to be live liver donors. I had no idea that the liver grows back. Did you know that? I had no idea. So my wife was like four years ago, we need a live liver donor. I'm like, who's going to be a liver donor? 
Who would give their whole liver? If my wife, who's a doctor, she goes, no, silly. They give a piece of the liver and the liver grows back. I'm like, it does? This is amazing. And so I shared Nuseba's story and over 500 people, mostly strangers, stepped up to be liver donors to the point where people who hate me, they told me, one guy said, I hate everything you've ever written. I'm like, everything? He goes, even your tweets. I'm like, God damn, even my tweets? But he said, but guess what? I stepped to, to be a donor and my mom is praying for your daughter. All this is to say it took a community, a multicultural coalition to save this girl's life who just turned seven recently and is right there making noise. You could probably hear her. And it reminded me that people still have the capacity and willingness to do and be good in this world. Sometimes you just have to invite them. And so I will end with the time that I don't have, but I know we have to finish up in a couple of minutes by saying this. I have three kids. I'm a dad now, middle-aged dad. My kids are named Ibrahim, Nuseba, and Khadija. They are brown-skinned kids uh, with multisyllabic names. And I refuse to tell my children that their inheritance will be righteous suffering, that the best they can hope for is to be a good victim, that they just have to sit there and smile with their white teeth and never rock the boat as a Mala minority, but instead just be content rowing the boat for others, that they should be grateful to be a sidekick, just to be satiated with the appetizers. F that. I'm telling them, go for the appetizers, go for the cheese that I can't eat because I'm lactose intolerant, but I still do. Go for the crackers, go for the go for the meatloaf, the enchiladas and the biryani, go for the chai tea, which means tea tea, go for the non bread, which means non bread, go for everything because everything belongs to them. Dream big and ask, why not me? Why can't I be the hero of the story? And then once they make it, inshallah, once they become the hero, once they get the seat at the table, their job isn't finished. We have to teach them to look out for those kids or outside of the tent and bring them in, extend their hand, give them shelter, and then invite that kid who was a stranger and who was outside and invisible. Give him a seat at the table, give him a plate so he can eat. And then finally, give that kid a pen so they can contribute a verse to the ongoing narrative that is called Amrika. Thank you for your time. I hope I didn't bore you. I hope you got your CLE credit. And I finished before four o'clock. Thanks very much, Waj, and thank you all for being here. As I promised, uh, Waj is always insightful and entertaining, so thank you. Take care. <laughs>